Hello, and welcome to another video lecture for Mr. Moser's 8th grade U.S. History class. Uh, this is one of our video lectures dealing with the Cold War. Today's topic, we're going to be looking at nuclear weapons and communist spies, the Red Scare in America during the Cold War. Uh, the textbook readings for today comes from two different sections, uh, The War in Korea and a New Red Scare, page 852 to 857, and then Kennedy and Foreign Policy, pages 894 to 897. Today's guiding questions are, what was the nuclear arms race? What was the policy of MAD? Why was, this, why was the only winning move not to play? What was duck and cover? How did the Soviet Union launch, uh, how did the Soviet Union launch a Sputnik create the space race? What was the Red Scare? What were some of the high profile spying cases that fueled this fear? And then what was McCarthyism? So those will be kind of our topics that we're looking at here today. One of the key aspects of the Cold War that dominates the Cold War is the nuclear arms race that takes place. Um, we were the first country to develop nuclear weapons, but very quickly after World War II, the Soviet Union will test their first nuclear weapon. President Truman will announce an even much stronger, more powerful bomb uh, that's 100 times more powerful than the ones dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, known as hydrogen bombs. And you can see here the photograph of a test here of a hydrogen bomb that was taking place or on an island that we use as a test space. But within only a matter of time, the Soviet Union will also detonate their first hydrogen bombs as well. So by 1953, both superpowers have this massive arsenal of destruction, these hydrogen bombs that, can, that are now 100 times more powerful than the ones that were used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. By the 1960s, both sides will develop technology to deliver these weapons of mass destruction um, by air, by land, and by sea. Uh, you'll have bombers that can transport these heavy, large bombs. Uh, you'll also have ICBMs, which stand for Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles. that can be launched from silos uh, in the United States or in the Soviet Union and hit their targets on the other side of the globe. And then, of course, you also have submarines as well that can sneak close to the shoreline of the adversary and launch their nuclear missiles as well. So both sides will develop these nuclear weapons and will begin to stockpile these during the lead up to world during the Cold War. Because both sides have these nuclear weapons, this policy was something known as MAD, which stood for Mutually Assured Destruction. The idea here, it would be complete madness to start a nuclear war because if you did, the other side would unleash all of their nuclear weapons and they would annihilate each other. So it was a par policy of what we call determined. You know, we're going to you know, kind of try to, to say we're going to deter a Soviet strike. If they attack us with their nuclear weapons, we will unleash all of our nuclear weapons and blow them up and vice versa, basically killing everybody. Uh, and so that was kind of the guiding policy of the Cold War from about the 1950s all the way up until the 1990s. And as you can see here from our graph down below there that the number of nuclear warheads that both the United States and the Soviet Union have continue to increase all the way up until the late 1980s. And so both sides had a stockpile of weapons that could destroy the other side very, very easily. When we talk about nuclear weapons, we're talking about tons of explosives. So one ton of TNT is kind of a measuring of explosive power. And then, of course, you have 1,000 tons of TNT is one kiloton. So one kiloton is a you know, measurement of explosive power. And the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Little Boy and Fat Man, were 15 kiloton nuclear weapons and 21 kiloton nuclear weapons. But during the Cold War, uh, you end up with one of the Soviet Union's largest nuclear weapons, which is the Tsar Bomba, which is 50,000 kilotons. These are massive, massive, powerful nuclear weapons. And so if you think about, you know, the nuclear weapon of the times, you know, this is a computerized simulation of what this would look like, but this is a massive explosion that would have taken place, destroyed huge amounts of area and space and territory, wiping everything out in the surrounding area, and then creating a cloud of radiation that would last for years. And that was the fear for a lot of people living during the Cold War was this potential for a nuclear war. Because they knew that if a nuclear war started, both sides would unleash their weapons under this policy of mad, mutually assured destruction, and it would be the end of the world. And so the best way to prevent a nuclear war was by not starting one. And 
that's the winning move here, and which kind of prevents the United States and the Soviet Union from really ever going into direct conflict with each other, because both sides knew that if they did, it could escalate to a nuclear war, and that would result into probably the end of the world. Another aspect of uh, the fears of nuclear weapons was some practice called duck and cover, which was a practice taught to, to the American citizens, especially school children. Uh, kind of like today how we have tornado drills and fire drills. During the Cold War, they had duck and cover drills. Duck and cover, duck and cover. Basically, to teach kids, if you see a bright light of a nuclear explosion, like Bert the Turtle in this comic book, uh, you could try and protect yourself by hiding under desks and chairs to kind of prevent a nuclear blast. Um, and so these are all kind of designed that, you know, if you can find a bomb shelter or you can find some kind of sheltering protection, that you can protect yourself from flying debris. Now, as you saw from the previous video, that if there was a nuclear war, you probably would not have survived. But it did give a lot of kind of a feeling that there could be maybe a chance of survival in a nuclear war. And a lot of families began building bomb shelters and uh, stockpiling those bomb shel shelters to try and survive perhaps a nuclear war. So this political cartoon here from the 1950s, you can kind of see that here you have uh, a very peaceful, tranquil family having a kind of a picnic outside, a nice little house, um, but it's sitting on an atomic bomb that's on the cliff looking like it's ready to tip over. And that was a big fear for a lot of Americans on during the Cold War, this fear of a nuclear war and the result that could come out of that conflict, which would be a destruction of all the world. Another fear that led to uh, fears of communism was the science and technology. You know, how did the Soviet Union so quickly uh, develop nuclear weapons? And they will be the first country to launch a satellite into space called Sputnik. So this is the first man-made object launched into outer space, and they will be the first ones to be able to do this. And so you have Sputnik, the first man-made satellite in space. You've got the Soviet Union building their own atomic weapons. It appears to many Americans that we are falling behind in science and math and engineering. And so there was a huge emphasis placed in the 1950s to put more money in education in the areas of science, math, and engineering to try and kind of catch up with the Soviet Union and creates what we call the space race, which is to try and see who can put the first man in outer space, which the Soviet Union will do first with Yuri Gagarin. And then we'll get the first man on the moon, which the Americans will actually get to uh, in the 1960s uh, with the Apollo program. And so this led to a huge advancements in science and technology. A lot of the technology that we have today, like GPS, cell phones, satellite communication, computer technology, a lot of that stemmed from uh, the Cold War uh, with this emphasis in improvement of science and technology. So the Red Scare kind of, uh, kind of, kind of, fits in all aspects of the home front during the Cold War. Americans see communists really everywhere. There's fears that there are secret communists kind of that are infiltrated into American society and that your neighbor could be a communist, your doctor could be a communist, your teacher could be a communist, that there is this fear that America could fall to this threat of communism. We see from this uh, graphic novel over there, Is This Tomorrow? America Under Communism, the American flag, being torched and burned as kind of these Soviet communist, uh, you know, brown-shirted military type are coming in and taking over everything. And so there's a lot of fear for a lot of Americans during the Cold War of these fears of communism and how it might impact and hurt the American dream and the American way of life. And these are definitely fueled by some high-profile spy cases that come to light in the 1950s that there were Soviet Union spies that were spying on the United States, which is one of the reasons what they were able to quickly develop nuclear weapons. Alger Hiss, a former department official for the State Department, uh, will be found guilty for passing secrets uh, to the Soviet Union in 1950 and will serve five years in prison for this. Uh, one of the most famous spy cases in the Cold War was the arrest and uh, conviction of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Both were convicted of passing atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, and they will both be found guilty of espionage and executed in 1953. From this fear of communism that seems to be like infiltrating the government, uh, it creates the formation of loyalty boards. 3,000 government workers will be forced to resign 
uh, from the results of these loyalty boards. Most of these accusations were were not truthful though. Uh, a lot of this um, was not based on a lot of evidence. It was more hearsay, rumor, could get you in trouble. And then HUAC was also created in the 1950s. It stands for the House Un-American Activities Committee. It investigated actors, directors, writers, aspects within American society that could maybe influence the way people thought and felt. Again, this is all this fear of communism, the infiltration of communism coming into America, taking it out the American dream. Uh, and so this battle of communism hits the home front pretty hard in the 1950s and into the 1960s as well. Most famously would become known as McCarthyism, uh, which was led by Senator Joseph McCarthy, uh, who will launch a massive Senate campaign uh, to root out suspected communists wherever they existed. Uh, we call this McCarthyism. Sometimes these were rich witch hunts where people were kind of falsely accused. People were brought before the committee and asked to you know to give names of other suspected communists to see how far down the rabbit hole this would take you. How many communists could we maybe kind of wrangle and snag and snare uh, in these committee hearings? A lot of Americans kind of lost their jobs and their reputations after being accused. So out of this fear, and there's some legitimate communism that was and, and spying that was going on by the Soviet Union and the United States, but McCarthyism kind of took it to the whole next new level where a lot of people's reputations were eventually ruined uh, as a result of these fears of communism. So in the 1950s and 1960s, throughout the Cold War, there's this fear of communism, and it'll play a very important role throughout the Cold War. Thank you for listening, and as always, if you have questions, please make sure you come talk to your teacher. Thank you.